Let us build our own computer language from scratch today, so that we can see and understand the fascinating steps involved. I'll not build another toy language for educational use here. Don't get me wrong, that has great value in its own, but I want a comfortable language I can easily write Tetris in, and I want that language to run on very limited hardware. For example, on this minimal CPU model system I have designed over the past two years. Check it out in the links below. In my previous video, I have touched upon basic principles of computer languages, the difference between interpreters and compilers, expression parsing, formulating grammar in Bacchus Naur form, etc. Today let's get a bit more serious. Let me introduce you to Min. Min is not Python, but it has Python style indentation. It only features the statements if, else, if, else, while break, print and define return. It has built-in functions like string conversion, user input, int conversion, length, key for non-blocking keyboard input and random, yielding pseudo-random bytes. Min features local and global variables and one-dimensional arrays, string and integer data types, functions with parameters and C-style ampersand referencing, optional colon and semicolon syntax sugar, a double dot array slicing operator and single quotes replacing Python's ORT function. So even though min is not Python, if you know a bit of Python, you already know min. I have carefully limited this spec to allow for complex structures on the one hand, while on the other hand keeping the implementation as lightweight as possible. And we can always expand. For starters, we are implementing this language as an interpreter in Python now. The whole thing will be under 230 lines of code. Let me make clear that what I present here is my handcrafted take on this topic as a curious and often lazy learner. I hope that my somewhat naive approach offers something to you that you might otherwise miss in abstract textbooks. Let us begin in reverse order by taking a brief look at the program written in Min so we can see some of its language features in action. Here we have a function definition with a parameter, some local and global variables and arrays, but no explicit types. This routine hands back different return values. Here we see the declaration and assignment of array variables, including element access. And down here we see array slicing operations all over the place, being used in while loops and if blocks and so on. Nothing special or new here, but that looks already quite comfortable to me. Now if you've installed Python on your machine you can try it out straight away by typing python min.py blocks.min. The link to the source is in the description. To make the terminal output look nice I've installed a TrueType font resembling the Commodore C64 style. I'll link to it in the description too. And guess what? I couldn't help writing another Tetris clone in min. They were so much easier than writing Tetris in assembly on the minimal CPU system or even in C or Java. Now that I've introduced you to Min, the important next step is to formulate its grammar in an abstract form. For this video I'll be using Enhanced Bacchus Nova Form or eBNF for this, not the original BNF. Feel free to check out the corresponding Wikipedia article. The link is also in the description. Let's walk through Min's grammar now, step by step. There isn't too much going on in the first paragraph. We define relational operators for math and arrays respectively. An identifier, that is a variable or subroutine name, starts with a letter and may then contain any combination of letters, digits or underscores. Note that white spaces include the colon and semicolon symbol, as we've discussed before. Line 16 to 33 define the general look and feel of the language, including its Python style indentation. This one took me quite a while to figure out. Up here we see that a file may consist of any number of statements, followed by any number of new lines, before reaching an end marker. And a statement itself may start with any number of new lines, followed by an indentation check, and then by either a simple line or a compound statement. A simple line means one or more simple statements, ended by a new line. And next we see what counts as a simple statement. Print, break, return, a call or an assignment. Now a compound statement in turn can either be an if, else, if, else or while block or a subroutine definition. 
An important part of these three constructs is one or more code blocks in which statements may be grouped together. Such a block can either be a simple line or, following a new line and an indentation, one or more statements. So here comes the power of recursion into play. The block is closed by a dedentation. When I say indentation or dedentation, this simply means a change of plus 2 or minus 2 in the target indentation level. This target level is compared to the actual measured indentation level during an indentation check I've denoted with okdent, as we've seen appear earlier. Whew, that's already quite a bit to digest here, so feel free to stop the video and take a closer look. The rest is going to be straightforward and we'll deal with expressions and types. First we define a general expression to be either an array expression or a math expression. We've already seen it playing a role as an argument of the return statement and of a variable assignment. Expressions can also come in lists of one or more comma-separated expressions. They are used as argument lists in print and in subroutine calls. There is one other type of list, the parameter list of a subroutine definition. It contains of one or more comma-separated identifiers, each with an optional ampersand symbol denoting a C-style reference. Let's take a look at arrays. An integer array can be defined between square brackets, like in Python. Anything between double quotes and also the input and string conversion function yields a character array or string. And of course, an array can be a variable or the result of a function call. The whole thing can be followed by optional slicing operations. Again, this is defined by using recursion. Next I've defined an array expression. This is just a nice way of concatenating arrays reusing the plus sign. Now on to math expressions. As I have already explained in detail in my previous video, a math expression is composed out of terms separated by a plus or minus. And terms are composed out of factors separated by a multiply or divide symbol. The only thing I've expanded a bit here is what makes for a factor. We see the round brackets appear surrounding a math expression, again making use of recursion. We can have a number or the ASCII code of a character between single quotes. I've also implemented a non-blocking keyboard input, sorry, that is only working on Windows right now, a string conversion to integer and a length function returning the size of an array. Next we have a random function returning a pseudo-random byte value and again the result of a function call or a plain variable. The very last possibility is an array variable, followed by an element access operator, turning it into a math factor again. The boolean section remains almost unchanged, as shown in my previous video. With a boolean expression being composed of boolean terms separated by OR, and a boolean term being composed of boolean factors separated by AND. My favorite is the connection to our math and array expressions here, where we define a boolean factor to be the result of a relation, involving either a math expression or an array expression on each side of a relational operator. And this is it. We've covered quite some ground and things got a bit more involved this time. I'm going to stop here for today. In the next video we will dissect how to code all the good stuff like implementing Python style indentation, handling active and inactive code blocks, simple function definitions and calls, global and local variables, functions with parameters, references and return values, and expression parsing with types and arrays. See you then. Take care. Bye.